So today we're looking at Millikan's oil drop experiment. Now this comes under the inquiry question, how is it known that atoms are made up of protons, neutrons and electrons? And for this experiment, we're looking at electrons in particular. Now for a little bit of context regarding this experiment, this comes just after J.J. Thomson discovers the electron using his CRT experiment. And the conclusions he came up with were that it has mass and hence it must be a particle and this particle has a negative charge. So what Thomson has done is qualitatively describe the electron. However, quantitatively, he hasn't yet described the magnitude of the charge of the electron. And that's where Milligan comes in. And the aim of his experiment is to find out what is the magnitude of the charge of an electron. And he goes about answering this question by setting up this following apparatus, where we have two chambers that are going to be separated by an electric plate on top and an electric plate on the bottom. And when there's electric plates, of course, there must be a power source. And this power source is created such that we have the negatively charged plate on top and a positively charged plate on the bottom. Now this upper chamber over here is going to be connected to an atomizer carrying oil. Now what an atomizer does is going to convert this oil in a liquid form into tiny droplets that are going to be dispersed through this upper chamber over here. So these are tiny individual droplets within this chamber. You can almost think of this as like a perfume bottle. And if we analyze the forces at play on these oil droplets, we see that the only force is going to be due to the force due to gravity. And this force caused these oil droplets to fall down into this lower chamber over here. Now this is where it gets interesting because what we're doing is we're also injecting x-rays in this lower chamber over here. And we know that x-rays are radiation. And what radiation is going to do is going to strike this oil droplet and cause an electron to be knocked off. We have this oil droplet that is neutrally charged at the start. An electron is going to be knocked off because that x-ray has hit the oil droplet. This is going to cause that droplet to become positively charged or ionized. Now, what we can do is analyze the forces at play again. Now, of course, the force due to gravity is going to be there. However, because of this ionization process, we've made this a charged particle. And we know that a charged particle in an electric field, as created by these plates, is going to experience another force, which is going to be the electric force. And the electric force follows the principle like repels like, so this positive or droplet is going to be trying to move away from this positively charged plate on the bottom. And if we take a look at this scenario in a bit of a larger detail, we see that we have the force due to gravity causing this droplet to fall down and the electric force causing it to go up. So what we've done essentially is created this tug of war between the electric force and the gravitational force, where if the electric force wins, our oil droplet rises, and if the gravitational force wins, our oil droplet falls. Now this gives rise to three unique scenarios. Firstly, what happens if the electric force is greater than the gravitational force? Well then the upper arrow wins and we know that our oil droplet rises. Secondly, what happens if the force due to gravity is greater than the electric force? Then we know that our oil droplet must fall because that lower arrow actually wins. However, we're most concerned with the third scenario where what happens if the force due to gravity is going to equal the electric force. If we go, go back to our analogy of a tug of war, in this case, no side is winning. None of the forces are winning over the other. As such, the net force must equal to zero and the oil droplet simply is suspended 
in midair. And we can actually analyze this by looking at a microscope in the lower chamber over here as well. If we look through the microscope at some of these oil droplets, they're actually going to be floating there and not moving at all, not moving up or moving down. So now the question comes, why is this important? Well, because if the force of gravity is going to equal to the electric force, then we can extend this equation into Fg equals to Fe. So that must mean that Mg, which is the force due to gravity, must equal to Qe, which is the force due to that electric field. And because Q is our main focus over here, which is the charge, we make Q the subject, and that gives us Q equals to mg on E. Now, the mass of these droplets can be calculated, and we don't need to know the calculation for the syllabus, but Millikan was able to calculate this. G is 9.81, and E, which is the electric field strength, can be modulated by changing the voltage of these electric plates. As a result, this is also known. So now if we know all three quantities, then we can calculate what the charge of these oil droplets are. So we have calculated the charge of oil droplets. Now, how do we go from the charge of the oil droplets to the charge of the electron itself? And that's going to depend on looking at a couple more results. It's important to note that Millikan didn't only look at one oil droplet. He actually looked at multiple oil droplets and calculated the charge of those droplets. And the results he obtained were as follows. So one oil droplet he noticed was 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. Another one was 4.8 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. Another one was 3.2. 8.0, 6.4, and so on. And individually, these results are quite unremarkable. However, if you take a look at them together, we see that they are all multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. And Milligan looks at this and thinks that is way too big of a coincidence to happen. And instead, he derives the following conclusions. Firstly, charge must be quantized or divided into packets, and each packet having a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. He looks at the lowest value he can obtain, which is that 1.6, and he says that the elemental charge as a result of that, or the lowest possible charge, must be 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. And we can use these two conclusions to explain our results over here. In our first case, what must have happened was one electron must have been knocked off the oil droplet over here. In our second case, three droplets, three electrons must have been knocked off the droplet, then two five, four, and so on. So this represents the number of electrons lost by the droplets, which is causing this positive charge over here. It's causing this positive charge because electrons are negatively charged. And if we lose a negative charge, then the net charge becomes positive. And as a result of this, he concludes that the charge of an electron must be equal to negative 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulomb. 